Everyone knows extensive practice is required to be more than passably good at something. Musicians spend countless hours on their instruments. Athletes train relentlessly. In military aviators, they absolutely need practice too. The problem is air combat training is either too theoretical on the one extreme or too resource demanding on the other. Sure, simulators help, but there's nothing like getting out there and actually going flying to truly hone your craft. Wouldn't it be great if there was a high-tech, low-cost solution to maximize training effectiveness against the latest threats with existing assets? Well, the amazing team at Red 6, a Southern California-based aerospace company, might just have the perfect solution. Imagine a pair of sunglasses where you have a little bit of tint, but you're still able to see out there. And now the characters and stuff that you would see in the virtual world are now put inside of those sunglasses. So you can still see everything around you. You can see your wingman, you can see your plane, all your controls, all of that. But then out in the distance, or if you're getting close to the merge, you start to actually see a real bandit that you can fight against. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here is your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to the show. This is episode 79. I am your host, Jello, and returning to help this week is Trevor Boswell. Long time no see, Boat. Hey, Jello. How's it going? It's going well, man. It's good to have you back. How are things? Oh, things are good, minus all the uh, the chaos of the world these days. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, yeah, no, things are about as well as can be expected. Yeah, and on that note, I wanted to ask you, because for us, we're pretty much stable here, not a lot going on. But I think the Boswell family was kind of in the middle of something when all this madness struck, wasn't it? Yeah, for sure. We were uh, attempting to move down to uh, Atlanta from Colorado, and we've successfully now gotten all of our household goods and vehicles and whatnot down there. And so the last little bit here is the people. So uh, should be hopefully wrapping this whole move up here in the next week or so. <laughs> all right. Well, sounds like you guys are no worse for wear. Not too bad. Now, I don't know if you caught last week's F-35 episode, but it was a big hit, as we hoped it would be. Everyone loves Cinco's interview and Chip's commentary. And as often happens, we did hear from listeners on certain matters. And there's one particular email I want to share about. It's from Vic from Huntington Beach, California. And he wrote, and I bet you'll appreciate this. He says, I really enjoyed the F-35 podcast. However, one point was not brought up about the current slash future relevance of dogfighting, rules of engagement. I tend to think learning how to dogfight in an F-35 is an insurance policy in case something went wrong tactically by the pilot or that there was some kind of system failure. It is also a policy against ridiculous ROE. If constraints placed on aircrew require a visual identification, then you may find yourself in the proverbial phone booth with a bad guy. Boat, I think he makes a good point. You know, the point that you guys made in the podcast and obviously what Vic is saying here as well is it is kind of an insurance policy. But at the same time, you know, one of the tenets, I guess, of the military is to always be ready. And so you need to be ready for as many scenarios as possible. And I think dogfighting is definitely one of those. So if you look at the three variants of the F-35 and how the A model is the only one with an internal gun, you look at what the trade-offs are of the other two and how those were designed with an external gun option, gun pod, if you will. And I think they kind of built those insurance policies into the design of the aircraft to support those contingency kind of situations down the road. Right. And as a matter of fact, we have a listener question about that very subject coming up. We'll get to that in just a second. But in other announcements, if you are a subscriber to the Fighter Pilot Podcast newsletter, you should see a survey request coming soon. If you have a few spare minutes, we would just ask you to answer the handful of questions just so that we can best serve you. Thanks in advance for that. Also, if you're looking for a place to be part of the Fighter Pilot Podcast community, I invite you to head over to our Facebook page. Look for the groups option on the left column and choose from the many offerings. If you're into aviation photography, we have a group over 2,000 strong now exploring those topics led by our team member, UK-based aviation photographer and aviation journalist, Rich Cooper. We also have groups for aspiring military aviators and a group for just folks that want to hang out and talk about the show or aviation in general, military aviation specifically. That's called the Raider Room. So check it out. All right, Boat. We got a couple listener questions. They're always building up, and I uh, thought maybe you could help get to those today. Can you 
You got a few minutes? Absolutely. Let's do it. Perfect. Why don't we start with a phone call? This is Steve from Salt Lake City. Great podcast, guys. Really makes my commutes to and from work much more enjoyable. My question for you is perhaps a little more philosophical than technical. I can tell we're similar in age. I chose a career in medicine. I'm a medical doctor. And even though I suspect we're both lucky enough to have enjoyed high levels of job satisfaction during our careers, it's not uncommon for folks at our age to look back and ask, what if? What if I had chosen a different career path? What else do I wish I could have done? I suspect my first response to that question is like many of the podcast listeners in that we would love to have been involved in military aviation with the pinnacle being a pilot and getting paid to fly. That's why so many of us tune in. So my question is, when the tasks of aviating get routine or mundane, do fighter pilots or now airline pilots daydream and ask the question, what if? What would you do or choose vocationally if you weren't a pilot in some other parallel universe? Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks for the call, Steve. Boat, in a parallel universe, what were you doing if not a fighter pilot? Oh, man. That's a really big question. I got a degree in architecture out of college, so theoretically, I guess I could go do that. But after however many years it's been, 15, 16 years of life in the military, I can't imagine myself doing anything different. So uh, other than being an airline pilot now, I guess being an architect, but man, I don't know what I'd be making, uh, houses or buildings or something. Who knows? How about you, Jella? Well, I've put a lot of thought into this. I'm almost ashamed to admit this, but you know, like the halftime shows with like J-Lo or Britney Spears or someone, you know, all those dancers they always have around them. I think I'd really like to have been one of those male dancers. I mean, that looks like a lot of fun. (laughs) Whatever floats your boat. (laughs) All right. Well, maybe not. Although I did used to like to dance when I was 18, 21, all that. But no, you know what? There was a time where I thought very seriously about trying to be a Navy SEAL and I think I probably, you know, they start classes of 130 people and they graduate about 25. I think I would have been one of the 100 because I probably just didn't have it to make it through. But I love the idea of scuba diving and skydiving and blowing stuff up and shooting things. Uh, I think those guys are awesome. So uh, maybe if I'd have been tough enough, uh, I couldn't be a fighter pilot. Maybe I'd like to have been a SEAL. Oh, yeah. Sounds like they get to do a lot of cool stuff at least. Oh, no doubt. So the next best thing is I'm trying to get my boys to go after it, but eh, we'll see. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that is a good question, though. Thanks, Steve. All right. Next up is an email from Taylor in Virginia who states the primary purpose of big deck carriers and fixed wing naval aviation is offensive power projection. Do naval fighter aircraft play or train to defensive roles at home, such as supporting Air National Guard units during aerial incursions? Certainly fleet defense is a massive training emphasis, but will naval air stations such as Oceana or Pensacola scramble fighters to perform intercepts or defensive operations? So, Boat, you're the perfect guy to answer this. You kind of hang out with the uh, NORAD crew, right? That's right. Yeah. So as I read through this question, the first and immediate answer is primarily no. That's primarily an Air Force uh, active duty or uh, Air National Guard or Air Reserve function. And so the Air Force and its subcomponents are the primary holders of that mantle. But, you know, obviously just in the off chance that something uh, requires more assets, I guess they definitely could pull up the Navy forces and ask them to help the cause. But uh, yeah, primarily homeland defense of the you know U.S., Canada, and Alaska and Hawaii are all primarily Air Force uh, responsibilities. Anything off the coast there is pretty much a, uh, a naval kind of traditional, what you would think of Navy f- uh, fight. Yep. We don't do a lot of Noble Eagle, but I will tell you about on uh, 9-11, 9-12, 9-13, 2001, we were, I was an instructor at Top Gun up in Fallon, Nevada, east of Reno, and we had our camouflaged FA-18As, because we didn't have any Cs back then, sure. loaded with live sparrows, because it couldn't carry the AMRAM, okay. and got guys sitting in their flight gear in the ready room, just hanging out, and of course, we were all like, what kind of world did we suddenly inherit? And it wasn't obviously formalized, no eagle stuff that was just okay we don't know what else is going to happen so let's just kind of knee jerk and make sure anyone anywhere is ready to go and of course nobody ever launched on anything but that's the only time where i've seen us involved in uh, some of that homeland defense stuff yeah yeah cool why don't we take another phone call hey jello thank you so much for uh, answering my previous question about the f-117 and its heat-seeking missiles and how it hunts the awacs my name is Varun, and i'm calling you from california I had another question about the last episode on the F-35. 
I want to know why the F-35C does not have an internal guns like the F-35A, considering its fuselage is almost similar to the F-35A. It doesn't carry a um, lift fan like the F-35B, so I assume it should have the space to carry an internal gun like the F-35A. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. All right, I put this question to Cinco himself, who answered, the Navy wanted to maximize carrier bring back weight. They also did not want to have to carry around an extra thousand pounds that you might use very infrequently. And this gets back to your earlier point, Boat. Just the fuel you save over the life of the airplane for not having that extra thousand pounds on board was significant. Now, I don't know. We could obviously drop anchor on this a long time, but it's very much a philosophical question. There's still a lot of heartburn over uh, the Vietnam conflict concerns with the F-4. I see both sides of this argument, and frankly, I haven't really thought it out well enough in my own head to decide what the best answer is. Jell, I I would say that one of the things that I kind of think of is what is the purpose of the aircraft launching specifically off of a carrier in this case? What is the point of what they're going out to go do? So I think of an F-35, you know, strike fighter, stealthy, all that kind of stuff. If the point of the mission is to go beat down the door of some enemy and get through whatever their defenses are, strike at whatever target set that they're going after, and a gun really isn't going to assist in that manner, then I'd say, you know, it does make a whole lot of sense and it gives them that extra thousand pounds of fuel and so on and so forth to go maybe a little bit further or just have that in reserves or whatever. I think for my purposes, it makes a lot of sense for them to keep the gun off and then be able to load that up on a required need yeah. to fight whatever forces uh, as appropriate once that type of fight gets in there. Yeah, I agree to a point. There's two issues I would raise, though. Number one is just based on my personal experience, even pylons on the wings. I don't know what it was like for the F-16, but in Navy squadrons, the ordnance folks and the maintenance folks would always have qualms about putting on or taking off pylons sure. because they can get a little torqued or you know, don't go on right or come off right or whatever. I assume technology is such that the gun pod is fairly modular, easy to just install and take off. And if that's the case, great. But my second point is simply, you're right. I mean, night one, you probably don't need it for the same reason. The sidewinders, which are within visual range weapon are only external. So that kind of blows some of your stealth, but maybe you don't need it night one. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's like a, anyone else who carries a gun. You have it because you don't know if you need it, but you certainly want it when you need it. As long as you can have a good idea, hey, for the next month, we're going to be supporting the guys on the ground and we might need a cannon to support close weapons employment. Okay, that makes sense. But yep. I don't know. You make good points and I'm sure you're right. And obviously that's what the folks who held the uh, purse strings thought. Yeah, hopefully anyway. Now, this next question I've had since last October, Boat, and I finally have an answer. So why don't you put it to me, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure thing. So Mitch from Australia says he was just looking at a photo recently of a Royal Australian Air Force Number 1 Squadron, FA-18F, from beneath. And you can notice a slight outward offset of the wing external tanks. And so uh, he'd be keen to hear why flight test development led to this offset. Yeah, that's a good question, Mitch. So when the Super Hornet showed up in the fleet, of course, we all noticed that right away and were up in arms about it. Not just because it was extra draggy, which it is a little, although I don't think the folks at Boeing believe that, but it just looks kind of awkward. It does. So I did put it to Boeing because I'd always heard different things and I wasn't sure. And they got back to me. I have a contact over there who's been very helpful with stuff lately. And his exact answer is wind tunnel tests showed certain bomb releases could cause bomb to bomb contact in certain situations. Several options were evaluated, including methods to modify the flow field and changes to the bomb racks. The best solution was to tow the pylons outboard four degrees, which solved the weapon separation problem, and retained aircraft performance. And again, I put a little own emphasis on that last. That's my emphasis, not his. But I don't know how you can take a super long drop tank, tow it four degrees, and claim that you retain the same performance. I mean, maybe the degradation is minimal, but to me, it seemed like the Super Hornet did not quite perform with drop tanks as well as a regular Hornet did. But again, it just kind of looks a little silly to me. Could you tell if it flew any different or anything like that? 
Not really. I mean, I'm no test pilot, but when I flew the two aircraft, and sometimes I would fly a Hornet and a Super Hornet in the same day. And of course, usually at Fallon, we'd have just a single centerline tank on, if any tanks at all. So that wasn't really an issue. But so, for example, as rockets, forward firing rockets make a comeback in the Navy, I've heard question about, well, how are we going to put those on the Super Hornet? Because automatically now you've got this four degree cant for an unguided rocket, but now they're starting to put lasers on and stuff. So I don't want to uh, bite the hand that feeds. Those guys are good to me. But on the other hand, I'm going to call a spade a spade when I see it. And I just wish they'd have come up with a different solution because, you know, fighter pilots, we want to look good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Well, let's finish with another phone call. Hey, Jello, Dave from Michigan. My question is concerning airline pilots that are former fighter guys. I am not adverse to flying commercially, but I kind of don't like not being in control of any vehicle that I'm in, including the commercial big heavies. But I am more at ease when it's an ex-military guy in the pilot seat. And my question is, is there any low-key way to see if your pilot is ex-military? Do they wear lapel pins, perhaps, with their old squadron tag or any sort of cue that I can take a look at and understand if maybe this guy's ex-military? Not that there isn't fabulous training already, but for whatever reason, I just feel a little better with military guys in the seat. So that's my question, Jello. I love the podcast, and I'll talk to you uh, later. Thanks. All right, Bo, you and I both fly for the airlines. In fact, the same one. What do you have to say to Dave? Dave, well, I think each pilot is going to have their own you know unique little way it may be a haircut it may be you know a tie tack it may be a lanyard with their id on it or something like that that would give you an indication that they were former military whether it be marine corps navy air force uh, maybe some other service that i'm unaware of i know for myself i have a little f16 tie tack that i wear and uh, that's right there so as long as i don't have my jacket on you should be able to see that but yeah there are definitely a few ways i guess that you could tell that they're former military and honestly if you were just ask i think you wouldn't have an issue or you wouldn't have anybody come back and give you any crap about asking because i'm sure they'd love to talk about it tell their story yeah as long as they're available to. And that's the one problem with boarding is we're always up there getting everything ready and don't have a chance to interact with folks. But no, I agree with that. I wear a little F-18 tie tack as well. And certainly you could pop in and just ask and say hello if it really matters. But I think to the core of your question, Dave, is are we better able to handle certain things because we're former military? And I guess that's a little bit analogous to making sure the bus driver used to be a Formula One race car driver. I mean, a bus driver is a trained professional. Pilots are trained professional. I've flown with former military. I've flown with pure civilian. And they're all equally good. And I have no doubts that they can handle just about anything thrown their way as far as emergencies or setbacks or holding or whatever. You don't just show up and become an airline pilot, especially a captain overnight there's a lot of preparation to get there military folks we have unique experiences absolutely but airline guys are are quality all around i would say oh yeah and i you know going one step further you look at the training programs we all have to go through the same training program that's right so you know that the baseline level of, of experience and qualification is there and now you just have other life experiences like any other career field has where some people may be stronger at one area than another and some people may you know, be having a better day than the other. And again, right. another yet another reason to have two pilots in the cockpit just on the off chance that, you know, one guy is maybe not as strong because they didn't get as good a sleep or whatnot. doesn't matter, but mm-hmm. uh, you've got both people there to, to make sure that you're uh, all going the same way and doing the right things. There you go. All right. Well, thanks for the help on the listener questions. That'll do it for this week. So, Bo, let's get to the feature episode. Now, for starters, we recorded this in early March uh, before this whole COVID-19 thing impeded travel. Yeah. And when I went up there that day, I didn't realize how many of us would be sharing microphones in the interview. So you might hear a little jostling as we move microphones back and forth. I know you'll forgive us for that. Also, we're going to try something a little different today. So the interview was broken up into two parts. We talked, and then I went out flying, and then we came back and talked again. So here's what we're going to do. But we're going to play part one. You and I will make a few comments, and then we'll finish it up with part two. How's that sound? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, any thoughts uh, before we listen to it? You've obviously had a chance to check it out in advance. Yep, I have uh, heard both uh, part one and part two. I think the concept is just fascinating, frankly, and the varied experiences and backgrounds of all the people that are involved in the uh, Red Six project or program, however you want to label it, is awesome because they all have a different kind of experience and perspective on all this stuff. So I think it's really fascinating and uh, hopefully listeners can get a lot out of the first part at least. 
All right. Well, let's let the good guys at Red Six take it away. All right. Today, the Fighter Pilot Podcast is in Santa Monica, California. We are at the headquarters of Red Six, and I'm joined by three different individuals who are going to help talk to us today about advanced training and other augmented reality things. So that'll be cool. Let's start with Dan Robinson. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Good to be here. Well, great. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be back. I just went to college not far from here at UCLA. So uh, you go by Bond? Yeah, I do for my sins. Okay. Next up, we've got Glenn Snyder. How are you? Doing great, Joe. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. All right. We'll talk about what all you guys do here in a second. And then uh, last but not least, T-Mac, Tom Mackey, you reached out to me. How's it going? Good. Thanks for coming, Jello. All right. You're welcome. It's good to be here. All right. So you guys know the drill, but with the three of us here, we'll try to keep it a little bit brief. But please let me know where you're from. What have you done if you've got an alma mater and what are you doing now? So Bond, we'll start with you. Yeah. Hey, so I'm Dan Robinson. I'm the token Brit in the group uh, out of the northeast of England originally. I was an RAF uh, fighter pilot, flew tornado F3s for the UK for a while, graduated the Brit Weapons School and then uh, became lucky enough to be the first non-American to fly the F-22. So uh, Raptors, uh, beginning of 2006, 2009, I, w- I was one of those initial cadre of, uh, of instructor pilots on the F-22. Bunch of stuff since then, left Georgetown, grad school, worked in finance, built a business, sold a business in the UK, came out here and started this crazy business, which is Red Six, which we're excited to be talking to you about. Cool. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. So you've got experience, I'll say, in a couple of aircraft that we've had on the show now. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, Tornado yeah, on the Raptor. Yeah, I heard a little bit of, of both of them, so it was cool. Okay, it was good. Cool to hear. Did you happen to know either of those guys? I'm trying to think who are... Gosh, I should have done my research. I didn't know the uh, the Brick guy. Okay. Uh, I think he was on the GR4, as I recall. Okay. Right? Uh, maybe a little before my time. All but, right. uh, the, How about the Stretch? Stretch. Uh, I was aware of him. I didn't know him personally, okay. but yeah, aware of him. Glenn, we'll go to you next. Uh, what's your story? <clears throat> so uh, my name's Glenn. I'm the, uh, I guess, chief nerd in charge. Uh, I'm the uh, <laughs> only non-military guy that you'll hear around here. Originally went to school in Savannah College of Art and Design, studying visual effects. Came out here and did a bunch of um, feature film stuff like Transformers, Star Wars, that kind of fun stuff. But quickly got over it and started looking into the VR and AR world when uh, Castro approached uh, our partner Adam and myself and said, can we drive cars in virtual reality? And we said, if you have enough money, let's try. And so that kind of sparked into Dan seeing that a few years ago and saying, hey, can you do that in a plane? And that's why we're all sitting here now. Cool. Well, we will get into that. And you're the only guy I have on my list here without a call sign. So by the end of this, guys, we need to see if we can't give him one. But if you work in close proximity with him and haven't already, then maybe he's eluded that. All right. And uh, T-Mac, why don't you give us your background? And you're sitting here in a flight suit that the listener can't see, of course. But you also... uh, some flying in your background, of course. Yeah, Jello. Uh, so from Chicago originally, uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, go into the Marine Corps, uh, and my first assignment was uh, F-18s, and I ended up flying uh, F-18s my whole career. Uh, five deployments, a uh, little over 3,000 hours. Uh, I was fortunate to be the uh, last class out of Top Gun, so we uh, started in Miramar, finished in Fallon, then came back, did some active duty and reserve time, and uh, I was working for a, a cinema company doing some uh, technology there, and I uh, had ran into the Red Six guys. So I was fortunate enough to be uh, coming on as the business development guy and second pilot with Dan and uh, the token Marine of the team. Well, we have quite the uh, spread of people with experiences and all that. All right, and I'm still mystified. You reached out to me on email, and when you told me some of that that you just mentioned, I thought, how have we not crossed paths? I'm sure we've been in the same briefing rooms at times and maybe just was a big group or something and didn't meet but uh very similar experiences i think you were a couple years ahead of me but also top gun also three thousand hours so i'm sure we were very near each other at some point can't imagine we were not in a debt or a bar right or something of uh (laughs) maybe not in that order (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) for sure for sure awesome this is really interesting now we all know what's coming but uh you know we haven't done it yet and i i hope the listener will find this interesting as well because again we're going to talk about some advanced training opportunities, let's say, that you guys are working on. We'll start it with T-Mac, but uh, Bond also, you can help me out. When you think about the spectrum of how we can learn to do the things that we've done, there's the whole range of options, right? One is you can just read a book and say, okay, I've got it. I can go out and do that. Now, of course, we all know that doctors don't do that and, you know, musicians can't just learn a book and go do it. But why is that difficult in our line of business specifically? Why is the theoretical not going to work too well? Well, I think Jello, part of the problem is that, you know, as the systems that we first started flying, T2s, A4s, uh, you know, F14s and the the like, the sort of fourth generation aircraft, one of the problems now is the airplanes are so advanced 
that the ability for us to train properly against those advanced threats gives us an increased training problem. You know, like I said, I was a F-18 guy, and so it, as a Marine, we're now referring to those as legacy Hornets, so that kind of hurts a little bit. Yeah. But, you know, the Super Hornet is still a fourth-ish generation airplane. So as Dan will talk about the challenges of training to F-22 threats against our near-peer threats in, in China and Russia are something we have to a- attack. And the traditional way of doing it obviously is not working. We're also combined with the fact that each of these services are drastically short of pilots. The airlines are starting to hire. So there's a uh, big shortfall in how we're going to train and, and now into the future. And so through, uh, as Glenn will tell you, his genius of developing this technology and, and Dan's vision of getting this done, uh, that's essentially how Red Six was born. Yeah, because, again, you're not just going to read about it and go do it, but the other extreme on the spectrum I alluded to is every mission, let's say we're going to go out with live missiles and employ them and shoot down drones. Bond, that gets pretty, what, expensive right away, and you have to have the ranges. That's not really realistic either, is it? Yeah, it's a difficult problem. I think to the core of your question is why do we have to do this for real? It's because the skills we've got are are perishable, right? So if we don't go out and do this for real, we lose them. Chair flying, we all grew up chair flying, you know, cardboard cutouts, and and that obviously evolves to simulators, which is good for repetitive tasks, et cetera, et cetera, but there's nothing like strapping a jet to you and going out and pulling Gs. As we know, we talk about it as something called cognitive load. And the cognitive load on the operator is vastly different when you're doing it for real as it is compared to doing it in a simulator on the ground. So the question is, if we accept that we go out and do this for real, and how do we make that A, efficient with resources we've got, B, relevant, and that forms the crux of what it is I think we're here to talk about because yeah. uh, you know certainly one of the problems that we had on, fifth gen changed the name of the game, right? It changes right. everything we were thinking about. And the core issue that we we're trying to solve is how do we get training that is relevant? and expose pilots to cognitive load and all of the stresses and strains of flying airplanes, but relevant within the resources we have. And I guess to piggyback what T-Mac was saying, there were three things that was, were the genesis of this business, the problems we were trying to solve. We're desperately short of pilots. Uh, we're dwindling budgets as capital rationing. We couldn't provide sufficient red air. And I think critically, whilst we've been involved in conflicts in the Middle East for 20 years, two things have happened geopolitically. You've got re-emergence of Russia onto the world stage and proliferation of technology and innovation coming out of China to the point where that uh, once overwhelming technological advantage that we once enjoyed has now been eroded to the point where we're on par. And so the question is, how do we train against near-peer threats? And I think the technology that we've developed at Red 6 is fundamentally different to traditional methods, but enables true near-peer training. And I guess that's what we're here to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get right into it because that spectrum we just talked about, we agree, I think it sounds like that neither extreme is ideal. So we have to find this middle ground where we can get the requisite training that pilots need and aircrew, uh, let's just say both. That can be uh, perishable, as you said. It can be difficult to simulate with real aircraft. It's not as realistic to just read about it or do it in a simulator. So now we have the new buzz term, at least that I'm relatively new with TMAC, is this live virtual construct, right? So they were just starting to do that in Fallon when I left there in 2015. As I understand it, they're trying to take all tools and find something that works that is, again, affordable, repeatable, and realistic, but really gives us the best training. So as we delve into this, live is what? Is that real people in real airplanes? Is that the L part of this conversation? Yeah, it is. I mean, that's exactly it. So live is real people, real airplanes, virtual people in simulators on the ground, linked up into the guys and girls that are flying up in the air. And constructive, you can think of it as AI-generated, artificial intelligence-generated bandits that, again, act as akin to the live bandits beamed up into the air such that the operator sitting down looking at their tech display or radar scope looks at those entities and the the aircraft thinks there are real airplanes up there in the sky. The problem with LVC is it's a 50% solution. Why is that? Because as soon as you transition from that sort of beyond visual range to 10 miles, the role of a fighter pilot changes, right? From tactician chess player to you put your gum shield in, you go for a fist fight. So you start looking out the window, you're like, where are these guys? The reality of it is they're not there. Why are they not there? Because we're unable to put virtual entities into the real world. Why is that? Because augmented reality so far hasn't worked outdoors and in dynamic environments. So it does now. And building on the tech that Glenn had developed in race cars, that was the genesis of the idea. When I saw what he'd done, I thought, man, that's got massive application for air combat training. And critically, if we pull it off, it fills the missing part of the LVC ecosystem. Yeah, gotcha. 
Okay, so let's talk about augmented reality. Glenn, well, let's pretend here for a minute that the listener doesn't know when in reality, I'm always the knucklehead on this show. But uh, I've been getting into DCS lately, Digital Combat Simulator. So at home, I've got the stick and throttle, the rudder pedals, a computer, and then I put on a virtual reality headset and I can pretend I'm out flying. How is augmented reality different? So augmented reality is essentially the same, um, aside from the fact that we're not obscuring the real world. So with virtual reality, we're trying to transport you into another immersive reality and kind of take you away from where you're sitting. So you're not seeing the computer, you're not seeing all the things that are directly in front of you. Um, with augmented reality, we're trying to mix those two worlds. We want you to actually look out and see the real world that's around you, but we want to bring in artificial targets that weren't part of your actual surroundings. That was one of the first conversations we had with Dan he said, hey, can we do this in a plane? And kind of jokingly, we said back to him, yeah, if you knew some guy with a plane. And Dan said, well, I'm some guy with a plane. But quickly, right after they said, but no one's going to allow us to fly with a virtual reality headset on, because that's what we did in the race car originally. Augmented reality simply wasn't far enough uh, advanced in 2014, 2016 to do this with AR. So the quick pivot from that was, there's no way we're going to do this with obscuring the whole world around them. How can we do it where we bring these effects into what you're actually able to see and keep that situational awareness? And that's where augmented reality kind of lends its hand. Okay, so in other words, I'm out in an LVC environment, let's say, in my F-18, and through the magic that uh, Bond was just alluding to, I've got contacts on my radar that aren't really there. And in the old days, if I get into the visual arena, they're gone. Now you're saying there's some way for what I'm wearing for me to look out and see something that I can actually see and what, even fight? Essentially, yes. Uh, imagine a pair of sunglasses where you have a little bit of tint, but you're still able to see out there. And now the characters and stuff that you would see in the virtual world are now put inside of those sunglasses. So you can still see everything around you. You can see your wingman. You can see your plane, all your controls, all of that. But then out in the distance or if you're getting close to the merge, you start to actually see a real bandit that you can fight against. That's crazy. I mean, again, this technology didn't exist, what, just a couple of years ago. I mean, is this, this blows my mind and I'm no programmer, but how is this even possible? Realistically, this application, this technology didn't exist until about August of last year when Dan and I got in the back seat and decided to go actually fly against the real technology for the first time. Before that, you know, it's demos, there's the HoloLens, there's Magic Leap, there are headsets that are out there that are commercially available, but they're all very, very um, confined to a single room experience or, you know, within 20, 30 feet, you can walk with them, you can go distances, but this, what we call slam mapping, or um, it's simultaneous location and mapping. They have small cameras around the headset that are trying to figure out where you are and, and where your head is and where you're looking and, and give you the proper visuals for that in real time. And they work very good in small room spaces or, you know, if you're on the ground and you have a very confined area for someone. But the second you want to be able to move quickly or go into a larger space, it all kind of starts to break down. And that was one of the first issues we were looking at with the plane was we need to be able to do this at 300 miles an hour for our application, obviously going faster as we go in front lines, but 300 miles an hour and with Dan going anywhere from five to you know nine Gs if he's feeling crazy. So we basically needed to uh, be able to design a tracking solution that was much better than you know what we currently have in commercial applications and also actually held up in what we're trying to do in the planes. Okay, so when I'm playing my DCS, it's very clear to me that I'm in a world that's not real. How, I mean, I don't know if there's an opportunity here to uh, go check this out, but uh, how realistic is it? I mean, when you're seeing something in this augmented reality world through this headset you're talking about, is it mistakable for real or is it very clearly, I mean, does it, I guess what I'm asking you is how good a job have you done? Is it jittering? Is it clearly uh, not real or, or is it believable? We're obviously still working out uh, issues along amongst the tech, but when it comes down to, I mean, the uh, you know the guys can speak more to comparing it to real world applications, but to me, I mean, the first time we pulled up behind the tanker, my mind exploded. I mean, I've never seen this in real life, so flying up behind you know a 747 with the boom sticking out and it felt like it was real, it just kind of melted my brain. But they can speak more to how real it is in comparison. All right, so hold on, Bond. So you've got the ability to fly up like close to an aerial refueler that's not actually there yeah that's the whole thing and uh if you know if you get lucky you'll get to fly with Tima here today and he'll take you up and see that to to answer your question uh can we tell it, it's not real yes it's digitally imposed right yeah, but does it look feel and act like a real airplane yeah absolutely it does really and so what tmac will do here later on today if we we get to take you flying is you'll you'll go up in in into the real world you'll you'll sit there with our virtual reality sorry augmented reality headset on 
And he'll go up and show you a static, a static target up there, which you'll fly in relationship to, and then he'll show you some dynamic stuff. So he will literally take you to a KC-46. You'll pull up on that KC-46, you'll see an F-22 on the wing flying around in the skies of Southern California. Hmm. You'll go from the wing to pre-contact around the back. We do it the boom in the Air Force, right? I've done both because I did the RAF as well, so I, I can talk to both, so don't give me any <laughs> um, And uh, well, so, <laughs> so yeah, you'll go into pre-contact, you'll see the boom hanging down, and the resolution's so good, you can identify the different colors on the boom, and then wow. T-Mac will drive you in, and, and, and it's so accurate, we can drive the boom of the uh, tanker into the cockpit. It'll drive it into your nugget. And then you'll come off there and uh, go to the wing of the Raptor. You'll see the Raptor there. And then if you get lucky, he'll take you to go fight a, an SU-57. Wow. Um, so it's pretty cool. Yes, it's digitally imposed. You can tell it's digital. But of course, that's the name of the game. But it looks, feels, and acts and, and maneuvers just like a real airplane does. Right. Which opens up an entirely new paradigm in training. Well, T-Mac, I want to go check this out because I'm having a hard time believing it. And then I think afterwards, my mind's already racing. I mean, this is a game changer. We could use this for a lot of different applications, I'm thinking. Yeah, you bet. I mean, uh, obviously, one of the things that we're focusing on is aviation. And it's interesting, as Glenn alluded to, the commercial market, you know, really isn't there. So there's no pain point for all the billions of dollars, the magic leaps and everyone else has put in there. Our day-to-day operations are we're not dying to wear ear pods or glasses or some sort of headset walking around. But there's a specific pain point right now for the uh, military, specifically for the aviation community. So this was Dan's thesis initially on the adversary training and how to do better training, which is now cascaded to just basic things like formation and how can we produce the same level of quality pilots faster by using these uh, technologies. And I think today, uh, when you look at the youth of today with multitasking with, you know, PS uh, threes and fours and fives and texting and talking and all these things at the same time, when you get to a Raptor or an F-35, that's a lot of systems integration. I think our approach is, is going to be really helpful. So, um, but we've been missing that visual piece, which is a critical component, which, you know, Glenn here has, has solved. So uh, let's go flying. Let's do it. All right. Well, we'll come back and uh, talk about how it went. All right. So at this point, I was going out flying with those guys. We'll take a little intermission as we said we would boat. Now, our previous tornado guest was, of course, Cameron Mackay. My apologies to Danger Man for forgetting his name in the moment there. And I have a couple other things I want to cover first, Boat, but uh, what did you think of the discussion? I think, you know, they're all very knowledgeable. They all have a vision, I think, which is awesome. And it's all the same vision and where they all want this to be. Mm -hmm. As you hear them talk and you can kind of get that sense or that passion that they have of how much they truly do care about what the end product is and really the purpose of why they're doing this. So it's really awesome to hear. Yeah. And then as far as the live virtual construct thing goes, I thought it might be helpful to maybe just come up with like a a quick example. So, but let's say in the old days, you're flying blue and I'm flying red. Uh You could theoretically be out in your F-16. So that would be the live part of it, right? Now I could be sitting in a ground-based simulator as the red guy flying against you. And I could be actuating the controls of the simulator and that would show up as a bad guy on your scope, let's say. Yep. And then with me or in different groups of other red air could be AI effectively constructive wingmen. So you've got the whole three there. And again, the idea being is that maybe we don't need all those assets to be airborne to get the training. But as the uh, folks at Red Six have figured out, that only works so well. Once you and I get in the visual arena, you're not going to see me if they don't have that augmented uh, solution. So the live virtual construct, I think, seems to be the way of the future. I think for the dollar and cents side of the house, it absolutely does because you exponentially increase the number of repetitions that a student or another pilot's going to get at seeing a threat representation and being able to work through those problem sets and gain that experience and continuous exposure to more high threat environment scenarios. Right. Of course, there's a lot of technology involved with that. How do I make it so that you and your F-16 see me and my simulator? But they're working on that and sounds like the technology is coming along. So that's pretty cool. Now, also, dare I admit, even formerly being the threat aircraft subject matter expert up in Fallon, I wasn't that familiar when they started throwing out SU-57 and PAC-FA and all that. What can you tell us about the Felon, as NATO calls this new aircraft? So the uh, SU-57 Felon is generically, you know, an F-22 ski, if you want to kind of go through (laughs) Cold War vernacular of uh, basically the Russians and I think the Indians at the outset had wanted to basically put together a fifth generation or at least what here in the West we would call a fifth generation. I believe they call it sixth generation out there. But either way, 
they wanted to put something together that was able to counter an F-22. And mm. essentially what you got was what similarly looks like the front half of an F-22 and the back half of an Su-35, where from the front, it's very stealthy looking and has all the sharp angles and everything with obviously their own differences. They have an IRST pod on the front and whatnot, but on the back half, uh, it doesn't quite carry the same weight of stealth that the F-22 has. And without getting into any of the classified realm, uh, there may be just not as much stealthiness from the rear hemisphere. Uh, so looking at the back of the aircraft as there is from the front, but overall, it is definitely a uh, very kind of scary looking or intimidating looking aircraft, hmm. especially when they throw some of those fancy paint schemes on there. Cool. Well, we'll look forward to learning more about that aircraft in the future. All right. Any other thoughts on part one then before we pick back up with part two? Boat? No, excited for the listeners to hear the second part. All right, let's get to it. All right, we're back. T-Mac, that was a lot of fun, man. Uh, gosh, I don't even know where to begin, but that was eye-opening. No, glad you enjoyed it. Uh, I just realized that you're the uh, first Navy guy ever to uh, fly with this uh, Navy Hornet guy, so really? uh, congrats. Awesome. Okay, excellent. Well, that's an honor I didn't expect. Well, who have you had flying? I mean, so this was a technology demonstration for me today. You've been showing this to other folks, I presume? We have. We've uh, been uh, very big in with the Air Force. It's a longer conversation if you go to our website, which you can link up later. But essentially, we've been working closely with the Air Force, being the biggest service for their uh, pilot training needs. So Air Combat Command has sponsored us, and we're uh, doing an integration with the T-6 this summer, their training bird. But mm -hmm. ideally, we're all training in a joint environment, you know, the Navy and Marine Corps to follow. So we're uh, just starting to work more now with uh, Sinatra, Chief of Naval Air Training, and uh, getting the Navy and Marine Corps on board. So just to uh, debrief here and let everyone know what we did. So we went over to the other side of the airfield. We jumped in. What do we call that airplane again? It's a Barracoot. Barracoot, which is like a longer, bigger EZ or something you said. It's got the push engine, yep. front canards. Really cool, by the way. And uh, It's like a fighter plane, isn't it? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I got to fly it a little bit. And then uh, Glenn came over and uh, outfitted me with a helmet. And we got out. We went up. Flew up uh, about 20 miles, 20 minutes uh, north, roughly and uh, just saw some different things. And I was impressed. I mean, it was, it was amazing. It, it really looked like those things were out there. I mean, I, I could you know, tell the difference. If there was a real KC-46 and the augmented one, I, you know, obviously there would be no distinction there, but um, you certainly are able to rendezvous on it and uh, see it. We had the boom go right in theoretically behind us and the F-22, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a you know early prototype stage, but like Dan said uh, earlier in the brief, uh, you can see the digital uh, makeup of it, but it's just going to get better and better to the point where you won't be able to tell a real aircraft from uh, the other. Right. And Glenn, you were saying uh, out there after we jumped out of the thing that although for now they're a bright white, which is a little artificial, but it was easy to see that that is what, just part of the early stages? Correct. Um, right now, things are, you know, we're still working on the brightness, latency, um, overall tech solution. This is still very much a prototype. We're in kind of alpha phases of showing off to our different customers. But our real goal right now is to get our brightness to the level where you can't really discern between, uh, you know, real aircraft and, and our augmented aircraft. Right now, we have everything uh, kind of tuned toward the brighter side of white. Um, just so that things pop against the sun and you're able to really see the demonstration. Um, but our goal and things that we're working toward over the next 18 months are going to get us to the point where we're using, you know, standard camos or standard uh, paint schemes on all the aircraft and trying to keep away from having to augment the actual um, texture or the modeling of the aircraft for you to be able to see in the headset. Cool. Yeah, that will be amazing because uh, it was already uh, very impressive. Uh, so it was a little bumpy out there. I'm afraid to admit to the audience, I, I didn't do too well. I actually got a little sick. <laughs> and uh, it's just because I don't fly small airplanes very much. And uh, I don't mind to confess that even through flight school, I was battling that and throughout my career once in a while. But uh, yeah, a little bit of, uh, what would we call that, mechanical turbulence coming off the Santa Monica Mountains there? Yeah, you get the, uh, the Santa, Cat uh, yeah. Santa Catarina winds, I think, coming yeah, up. Santa, Santa Ana winds coming yeah. over there. The yeah. mountains, it gets really bumpy. But hey, Jello, just for context, I've been sick in every airplane I've ever flown. So Really? Yeah, no, no right. great shakes there. And you're a studly uh, tornado F-22 guy. Okay, well, for those of you young folks out there that are concerned about that, man, you just got to power through and work with it. And uh, <laughs> certain things you can fix, certain things you can't. But... Thankfully, I didn't have too colorful of a breakfast because it was a pretty benign. Anyway, let's get past that. My mind is spinning. I mean, this is amazing to think about, again, an air-to-air -air refueling aircraft that we could pull up 
next to, you could fly formation, you could fight someone else, but it doesn't stop there. I mean, you could really use this technology to possibly do what? Could you launch a fake surf air missile at me? Not fake. I shouldn't use that terminology, right? But Or could we do things on the ground? I mean, where does this go? Yeah, the uh, so the genesis of this, uh, the tech was obviously to help solve the training crisis that uh, the US Air Force and all, all of the broader air, air components of the, the services are experiencing. But of course, we don't just go to war as an Air Force or a Navy Air Force. We go in the joint environment. So the ultimate vision of this is connecting all war fighters across all domains together in a joint augmented battle space. And, and whilst this is the genesis of it, it rapidly expands because if you think about it, we've, we've solved it in the most dynamic environment, three, 400 miles an hour pulling nine Gs. And as TMAC hopefully showed you, you were barrel rolling around these things and it was tracking just great. Well, if we've solved it in that environment, by definition, we've solved it for all other vehicles around. So the vision is to connect all war fighters across a joint augmented battle space, enabling training. And I think the other thing worth noting as well is that it's not just training applications for this as well. There's real war fighting applications for this. And, Immediate examples that spring to mind are how do we train with JTACs? One of the things that I was really sort of interested in figuring out was how do we shorten the kill chain between guys and girls calling for help on the ground and us getting bombs on target from above? Mm -hmm. And how do we do that whilst removing ambiguity and that kind of pucker factor of not wanting to pickle in the fog of war when you're, there's confusion and chaos and everything? We all know as fighter guys that are, are dropping or supporting ambiguity is in there and if you get it wrong the consequences are, are terrible yes so one of the things i was thinking well look if we could put soldiers on the ground into this uh, environment or an augmented environment whereby we could paint just boom here we go there's a blue beam of light they're the good guys boom there's a red beam of light there's the bad guys and we link that up into the guys and girls in the airplanes up above then that's a really interesting way that we can um, we can shorten kill chain and get bombs on target real quick and save lives. Glenn and I have already started uh, experimenting with that, and the early indications are that it looks really encouraging. Well, what about even just administrative phases of flight? I mean, if there was crummy weather, but we could build circles in the sky that are getting progressively smaller to lead me down to land, whether it's at a field or even on the ship. I mean, there's a lot of different things we could do with this. Yeah, definitely. And not just for the military side as well, the commercial applications. For how do we, we, again, we go back to, we wanted to solve the Red Act. That was the genesis of the, right. the, the program. But then it became really apparent that we can do basic flight training, drawing patterns around airfields, corrected for wind, physically drawing airspace so we don't bong it, right? Drawing mowers so we don't fly outside of them. And then things like ILSs, you know, instrument of procedures into airfields, things like startle events, what happens if you go around suddenly. So there's multiple commercial applications for it, not just the Air Force and Navy, but for the airlines as well. I mean, you guys are both airline guys, right? And, right. and when is the, the sort of maximum workload in an airline is generally when you get those startle events on the go around, I guess. Mm -hmm. Unusual attitudes can happen. Well, if we can just draw these procedures in the sky and you literally have that visual reference to go, not just am I backed up by flight instruments, but I can visually see where I'm supposed to be going. It's a real situation awareness enhancer well and glenn you know when we were out there just now getting ready to go you had a keyboard and you were connected to us and you're programming things my big question i guess for you is how does this work in a dynamic environment or is someone able on the ground to send something or are we in the aircraft able to program i mean what's the future of the ability to do something quickly or dynamically so we're, we're currently working on that control, actually. Um, I have a standalone program and system that we're creating that's um, allowing the guys up front, both TAN and TMAC here, something that the, uh, the, you know, the viewers can't see is we've made an entire instrument panel within the aircraft that we're using as a test bed that controls the entire system in the back with toggle switches and you know, lights to system status. And what we've uh, started to build now is a separate standalone um, embedded computer that basically lives between the hard switches and the computer and allows it to make, uh, you know, what we'll say is computer conversations between the controls up front and the actual start and stop of the system in the back. We've also developed a system for our instructors in the back seat to have an iPad that allows them to select scenarios and change what they want that scenario to be. You know, initially it's BFM, so we have, you know, TAC 90 left, TAC 90 right, you know, TAC 180, stuff like that. Allow them to select those scenarios and prompt them start, stop, pause, move in between. Um, but the system itself is getting more and more robust every time that we, uh, we deployed into another aircraft. So we're trying very hard to make it so the guys up front don't necessarily need someone in the back seat to control it for them. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, Joe, as well, Glenn talked about it in terms of kind of scripted scenarios that we've provided for students right now and those things are working, as you've seen. But the future vision of this is there's mo there are many complementary technologies that are evolving in parallel with this and artificial intelligence being one of them. So one of the things we're, we're looking at and working with now are a couple of companies that are, are putting artificial intelligence bandits in there, which is kind of scary because these are thinking 
BFM bandits that will fly against you. And we've done early trials with this stuff, and it's pretty compelling. T-Mac and I are still just about winning, yeah. but it's getting close, and it's getting yeah. scary. So you start layering this in now, and then all of a sudden, you know, based on the intel we have, we layer in the artificial intelligence, and now you've got thinking bandits that you're actually going to go fly against that we know uh, act and operate doctrinally as we would see for real. Yeah. And that's an incredible training proposition. So is that the future then for the company as far as develop this technology? Are we sticking with the military aviation or are we branching out? I mean, obviously you don't want to spread yourselves too thin, but what's the future for Red 6? Yeah, it's a good question. Certainly our initial uh, breach head is, is in through the military, and more specifically the Air Force. What tends to happen is the U.S. Air Force adopts something like this, then we all need to train with the U.S. Air Force. So generally speaking, everyone else will follow to a lesser or greater extent. So it, it looks like Air Force is the bulkhead. We're already in conversations with the Navy, as T-Max alluded to. And then, you know, the, just the same way that the Air Force has the problems the Navy do, the Marine Corps do, the RAF do, the Aussies do, the Canadians do, all allied nations have the same problems. And what, what we should be doing is connecting together in a training environment that we can all plug into. So that's the vision for either the first couple of years, expanding this across allied nations and then across domains into the warfighters on the ground as well. And beyond that, we get into some really interesting aspects of spatial computing as, a, as an overall future and what that means for the consumer mm -hmm. and a consumer solution for spatial computing that works outdoors in dynamic environments is a key enabler to a ubiquitous spatial computing future. So I think we've got the genesis of, of something pretty special here that has oh, yeah. broader applications worldwide. Well, yeah, I mean, that's probably an understatement, but I mean, new drivers, uh, motorcycle riders, even people in academia who are maybe learning something about the human body. I mean, good grief. There's so many possibilities for this and it's crazy. But again, T-Mac, we were talking about, so today we wore a fairly specialized helmet. It's the same, I think, Glenn, you call it the HG55. But ideally, ultimately, again, you guys are getting going. Ideally, this is something I'm wearing anyway. Uh, but at some point, then this capability comes in and it's somewhat transparent in a sense. Uh, maybe a bad pun, but... Right. No, I mean, ultimately, it's going to have to integrate with the current aircraft systems. As we all know, anytime you want to change a red wire to a green wire in an airplane, it's a you know onerous process yeah. and changing and whatnot. So while the prototype we have right now that uh, Glenn has uh, designed, you know, Dan and I come from the flight community, ultimately, as Dan would say, it's going to be a, a visor and, and drops down. That's your gateway to the augmented reality world. And so that's how we see the the end product. Uh, we'll have some, some milestones and things that we'll do beforehand that'll, that'll prove the technology out. But ideally, there's a few companies, Gentex being one of them, where they're making a new modular helmet. Mm -hmm. uh, much like night vision goggles, you pretty much put them on and then you drop the goggles down and off you go. Mm -hmm. That's how we see this technology working for the uh, airplanes. It's designed to be plug and play. So what you saw today is agnostic technology inside the Barracoot. And what we'll do is uh, Textron is a company we're working with to integrate with the T6. They're coming out here and fly with us in a few days. And we'll start to essentially take the technology out of the Barracoot and start to implement that in a sort of a crawl, walk, run phase, T6 mm -hmm. being the first one, and then eventually into uh, fourth gen and fifth gen aircraft. And speaking of night vision goggles, is there an application for this in inclement weather, darkness, nighttime? Yep, I mean, in the same way that we have synthetic vision in your, your sort of heads down instruments now, I mean, it's kind of crazy now, isn't it? And that's experimental airplane you're flying around and some of the systems are way more advanced than like an F-22 and F-35 in terms of, <laughs> of what it does, right? right? So yeah, the ability to to take that synthetic vision and put it up into the field of view of the pilot whilst is looking out is something that's, I think, a, a, a potential value proposition. And again, you know, things like being able to visualize real airplanes at night, for example, mm -hmm. you know? augment them at night or in low visibility even applications taxiing around on the ground in low visibility getting directions right signposts yeah. things like yeah, that there's, sure. a, there's a bunch of cool stuff you can do with it all right guys well man this has been really educational informative and just exciting for me I, again the prospects of where this could go is pretty impressive we can go ahead and transition to the final here i presume the answer to you know what does the future hold for you guys is keep churning and plugging away i glenn i know you've got quite a bit to do still but uh what's the next for you like you mentioned i got quite a bit to do between now and uh july and august when we need to show this in uh t6 but yes uh, continuing to work with dan and t mac and the rest of the crew to keep pushing this technology as far as we can you know uh Three, four years ago when we were doing this in a car, I thought that was kind of fun to do for a bit. And we thought maybe we'd keep doing it in more cars. But the second the plane showed up, that vector changed very quickly. So we're, uh, I'm planning on continuing doing this until we, we have something that we're really proud of to have everyone flying around with.
Yeah, no doubt. Well, unfortunately, I can't ask you the uh, final question we always ask because you don't have a call sign yet, but that's your tour, guys. We could you, give them one, right? Yeah, we could. <laughs> a fighter pilot podcast first, you bet. Is there a rating on this podcast? Uh, <laughs> we usually keep it family friendly. <laughs> I've done enough behind the closed doors with these guys that uh, they probably have something ready for me. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> All right, Tom Mackey, T Mac. I think I can figure this one out. Uh, any fun story on your call sign? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, it was name based. I got it when I was uh, flying A4s and it kind of stuck through. There was a few unsavory ones that were along the way that uh, didn't make it. So uh, <laughs> that's that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Cool. All right. And I assume you're uh, here for the long run as well. And uh, you've got other stokes in the fire, but uh, you keep playing this game a little bit, huh? It is. I mean, the one thing that I think you've, you've gotten here is, you know, we have a small team and, you know, Dan uh, leading this uh, group, as he says, a roving motorcycle gang, which is completely <laughs> accurate. It's great because we've created a, a squadron culture. And ultimately, this technology is going to save warfighter lives and it's going to increase the training. So, you know, me coming from that background, especially, it's just it's a, it's a great team uh, with great technology. And it's honestly fun to come to work every day. I'm wearing a flight suit to work and uh, going to fly and, and work with these guys and gals. This is fantastic. No doubt. I would argue it's going to do more than just save lives. It's going to save money. It's going to build efficiencies. It's going sure. to make people more effective. There's almost no stop to the accolades. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, Dan Robinson. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Bond, huh? Uh, yeah. Come on now. Lean into the microphone, please, there you sir. Go. Well, uh, the, Joe, there's a couple of stories to this one, uh, one of which I, I can't tell because you'll get shut down. All right. Uh, so I, I guess the obvious one is, look, when I came to the, uh, the F-22, it was right in the early days of the Raptor. So guys in those days, everyone was a thousand hour plus experienced guys, right? A lot of weapons school guys. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the Raptor, they're like, well, the, the Brits, we don't really do call signs. They're like, you haven't got a call sign. So I actually became the first person in history ever to be named on the F-22. Huh. And of course, at the early, in the early days, it was, it was such a classified program. I mean, I guess it still is. Yes. And I had full access. I had all the clearances and everything, and I was just a part of the squadron. So they were all convinced I was a British spy, and hence I, I got the call sign Bond. Now, there is an acronym behind that, which oh. I will share offline, which is probably not appropriate right. for the viewers, but it's a good story. But as an aside, a quick one for you, um, really serendipitously, the airplane that you just flew in, which I, I built, the Burkut, that was a, a very early pre-production version of the Burkut that was lost in the desert for 21 years. And the serial number on that airplane, believe it or not, is pre-production 007. Uh -huh. So how's that for a bit of serendipity? Huh? <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. And uh, I think you said it at the beginning, but just to reiterate, I mean, this whole thing was really your brainchild. I'm going back to the Red Six now, right? I mean, this is your baby, right? I mean, it is in that it was a problem that I cared passionately about, right? Mm -hmm. Because I look at what's happening in the world and I look ahead to 2013, I can see what's coming, right? And, and we obviously want to deter aggression by projecting strength, right? That's the name right. of the game. No one right. wants to do that. So to do that, we have to be credible. And to be credible, we have to be able to train relevantly. So that was the passion about solving this for the warfighter and helping to, you know, to give realistic training to the guys and girls that we love and are dear to our hearts. And I didn't do anything particularly special other than, you know, surround myself with really smart people like Glenn and, and, and Nick and the rest of the team. I just connected the dots. So when I saw the tech that Glenn had built back in 2015, I put two and two together and, and came up with five initially, but we worked that down to four and now it's working. So <laughs> it was really just being the right place at the right time with the right yeah. experience and then connecting dots. Well, I know you're understating it because it also takes vision and leadership and initiative and nobody will do a project quite like the person who's got the idea will. So I hope we can keep in touch because I really like to know how this goes for you guys. And I'm glad that I can help kind of get the word out a little bit. I mean, it sounds like you guys are on the upward part of the hockey stick trend now, if you will. Uh, but for those who might be interested, are you guys on any kind of social media or website or where can we find out a little more about Red Six? Yeah, you can follow the story of Red Six right from the beginning of the airplane on my Instagram uh, at Berkut Driver, which is B-E-R-K-U-T Driver. Uh, that's the Instagram. The, the website is red6ar.com. Glenn's got a, an Instagram as well, which he uses. Yeah, if you want to follow more of the tech side, it's uh, underscore Glenn, G-L-E-N-N, Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R on Instagram. And uh, once we have our passwords situated, we'll have a Red Six Instagram separate as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be happy to link those for you for you guys in the show notes. Well, guys, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me up today. Thanks for the flight. That was great. And uh, as I always say, unless you got any parting shots, I think we can wrap this up. Cool. Thanks very much. All right. All right. Well, 
First off, yeah, Boat, I admit it, I did get airsick in that little plane. Um, but to be fair, it was really bumpy that day, and I wasn't always at the controls. And it's just funny to me. I mean, most of my adult life has been spent in aviation. I can still get a little queasy. Oh, yeah. I'm, I definitely have that in my history as well as uh, kind of was out there or was said in the, in the uh, second part there. It, it's not unique to you, me, or anybody. It happens all the time. I can remember going through pilot training, and it was definitely a rude awakening to my uh, vestibular <laughs> system to uh, get in that airplane. How was the visual for you in terms of peripheral, being able to see the horizon or anything when you're under the, the display? Oh, it was fine. I mean, the display was just on the helmet that I was wearing. Okay. Uh, now, I was in the back seat of the Burkut and did not have quite the good visibility that the guy in the front did, but it was still very good. Okay. And so it literally was just one of those days where a, a front had just passed and we were going over the mountains. And at one point, we hit a little pocket of air where I whacked my head on the top of the canopy because <laughs> it dropped so fast. Yeah. So I thought we'd make it and we had the airport in sight, but finally I gave up the ghost, but it, <laughs> it was, it was just bouncy and we were pulling G's and I'm not proficient in that anymore. So I know it's fair. the reason I bring it up is for young people who might be worried about that or struggling with it. Uh, it's okay. Like boat just said, it's something we all deal with and hopefully you can build the tolerance. And again, to be fair, some people never can get over it and that can be a problem, but for everyone else, it's just one of those things you deal with. Definitely. So as I think more about this technology Red 6 is developing, I mean, you know, I was starting to say it in the interview there, I'm just blown away. If they can field this the way they suggest, game changer. I mean, I know we used that a lot in the F-35 episode, but I think it applies here too. Just thinking about the various combat training applications, the military and civilian applications, gosh, where doesn't this thing go? Honestly, I can't see an end at this point or a limit to where this potential technology and interaction between the live and the virtual, um, obviously like the name entails, ends. Yeah. And I think that the most amazing part is that, you know, they started with a vehicle and trying to incorporate into that. And then this is obviously at the very you know outset of their program, but they jumped into an airplane, which seems, you know, relatively speaking, like a huge leap in technology. And I think some of it's maybe just a scaling size and a weight thing for the platform. But you look at the overall exponential leap in potential for where this could go. And I think it is absolutely an awesome thing for them to dive into. And especially when you look at all the other people around the world and other organizations around the world that are trying to do this as well. Uh, it's pretty awesome that this group of guys has found their niche and is just charging forth. Oh, and having a good time doing it too. The little bit I was there that day, it was like being back in a ready room. So yeah. it was a lot of fun. And it'll be cool to see where these guys go from here. A big thanks again to the whole Red Six team, including today's guests, Tom Mackey, Glenn Snyder, and Dan Robinson. And by the way, if you want to know more of Bond's amazing story, check out the Afterburn podcast with our friend John Waters, where Bond was appropriately episode number, guess what? 007. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, we can begin to wrap it up for this week then. As always, we want to thank our new Patreon supporters, which include Strike Leads, Jim Gundog, Alex Matab, John Lumpkin, Alex Barucki, Sebastian Viali, Lance Walsh, Chris Bocchino, Alan Jeffries, and we have Mission Commander Gordon Bradbury and Air Bosses Mike Turner and Kit Sam. And Bo, you know, I just can't say enough about our show supporters. I'm so grateful for them and we're having a lot of fun. In fact, the other day we all jumped on a Zoom call and we talked about the future of the podcast. We just answered questions and had a good time. It was really cool. So if you all want to join the club, head on over to patreon.com and search for the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Please know the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Bo, thank you for taking the time to return to the show today. It's always a pleasure, dude. Hey, Jello. Thanks for having me. And a quick plug for the uh, the Facebook groups and uh, everybody trying to jump in on those. If you're not a member in any of those groups, please do answer the questions for the uh entrance questionnaire that we ask just so we can get a little bit more about you and what you're interested in and uh, hopefully help get you better information down the road and, and just enhance your experience overall. But other than that, Jello, thanks for having me back. It's been an awesome uh, time uh, helping behind the scenes and uh, I look forward to where the show's going down the future. Oh, well, you've been a big part of that and I appreciate it. Now, hold on before you go though, as we do, we flip flop. We're all back to the aircraft series next week. Any suggestions? Jello, I, you know, it's, we dive in fighters and bombers and we got the Greyhound in there and everything else. And, you know, I think we may want to, to represent some of our other 
I don't know how you would call it, brethren in arms. And I hearken back to my days as a kid and just listening to my mom sing uh, some songs to me. And I don't know, just it feels like like dragons and and puffing and I don't know, something like that would be, <laughs> would be something I think would be maybe interesting to hear if anybody can figure that one out. Hmm, well, that sounds a little spooky, so we'll see what we can do, but uh, sounds like a plan. Friends, be well, take care of yourselves and each other, and we'll see you all back here next time on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening. Mr. Ayello, my name is Marianne Davies. I just recently um, subscribed to the podcast. I was referred to it by a fellow coworker at my law firm, but I am a mom of a Navy F-18 Super Hornet pilot who is about to get underway on his second deployment on the Nimitz. He was on the Theodore Roosevelt two years ago, and you know, as a nervous mom dealing with that situation and worried about all the things that are happening right now. But anyway, I just wanted to tell you what a fantastic podcast and website. I'm so excited. I shared it with my fellow USNA aviator moms. We're a a pretty large group. Our kids have all gone to the academy and are in various places around the world right now. But anyway, I want to thank you and tell you how excited I am to listen to the show. Thanks. Bye.